In this episode, we reviewed Zabriskie Point, which was released in 1970. This was directed by Michelangelo Antonioni. He also co-wrote the script with Franco Rossetti and Sam Shepard. The film starred Mark Frechette, Daria Halprin, and Rod Taylor. Welcome to Robert Bellissimo at the Movies. This is a YouTube video podcast exploring storytelling on film, as well as interviews with industry professionals who work in film, television, theater, among other areas of the arts. I want to welcome back to the show, Duke Haney, who is a writer. His books include Band for Life, Subversia, and Death Valley Superstars. One of the subjects in Death Valley Superstars is Mark Frechette, who is the star of the film that we're talking about today, Zabriskie Point. Duke, welcome back. Thanks for joining me once again. Well, thank you for having me once again. Not only do, 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 do my books include those, those are all of them, the ones you mentioned, the titles. You mean the, 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 that yeah, I included the My books the include, and I was going to say, that's all of the books. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see what you're saying. I was <laughs> hey, well, it's hard enough to write one book. <laughs> I imagine, let alone three. But uh, yeah, no, as I was saying, if, for anyone who hasn't read this book, uh, every essay is is so fascinating. And I reread the Mark Frechette one, which I'm sure we'll get into. But I, I was curious, because I you you suggested doing doing this film today, which I hadn't seen before. This is the first time I've seen it. Uh, do you remember the first time you saw it? And has your feelings changed about it over time? Um, I remember very well, first of all, um, uh, I heard about this movie as a child um, when I was seven or something, this little kid named Michael Wood said to me something about, you know, it's a brisky point. It's a movie where people all get naked in the desert. <laughs> it sounded pretty interesting to me. <laughs> but the movie stuck in my head for that reason. And then when I, a few years later, a couple of years later, whatever it was, um, I saw in the paper that Mark Burchett uh, had robbed a bank and and died in prison. I just thought that was amazing that a, a person who had starred in a film uh, so well known that this little kid Michael Wood would would uh, knew something about it. You know, they're all they all get naked in the desert. Uh, that a, uh, the star of a movie could rob a bank and die in prison. So that story stuck with me. Um, and then there was a book um, I've forgotten the title. It may be the Golden Turkey. A turkey's book or something but it was the 50 worst movies ever made right uh, a guy named michael medved who's a right-wing idiot now um uh wrote this book i think with his brother and this movie was inexplicably in it um probably along with uh plan nine from outer space and some other things and that was kind of surprising to me too i mean how could a film like this be in a book like that um of course the film was widely reviled uh in its yeah. day and, and it's it, it's still reviled by some, um, but um, uh, but uh, finally I got a chance to see it uh, when I moved to New York. I saw it at the Bleecker Street Cinema um, in Greenwich Village. Uh, I, I mentioned that the last time that uh, I was on your show. I saw The Misfits there too. It was in the same period when I saw The Misfits. Oh. And I thought it was, I really liked it quite a bit. I, I mm. couldn't understand why everybody hated the film. And um, so I had the same feeling. I really took to it. And I was like, why? I can understand why it may, in America, people wouldn't have maybe got it or liked it. But uh, like even critics, I mean, people that you think would see something in it. But like you said, you go, I mean, I read some reviews like Roger Ebert. Like, I mean, he called it flat out stupid. I was like, mm. what are they missing? I mean, <laughs> it's pretty it's pretty simple. I mean, it's obvious what he's what he's communicating, I felt. You know, I thought it was really good. Well, I think that was part of the problem is that some people, I think, felt that uh, he was a little too obvious. Antonio had been a little too obvious. It's a satire, uh, for example, um, uh, <coughs> with this real estate development in the desert. Um, I guess maybe before we, we begin to jump into it, uh, we should, uh, you know, kind of talk about the plot insofar as there is a plot. Uh, sure. but, uh, but I did want to say that uh, watching it again a couple of uh, nights ago to prepare for this, um, I, I, I like the film as much. I mean, I love, love it more than ever. I, I was actually more moved by it, I think. I think the vision of the film um, um, uh, not only 
was it, uh, what's the word, corroborated um, in its day because the state, uh, Kent State killings took place uh, only about two months after its release. Um, but uh, it, it uh, I think it was prophetic. I, I think that uh, it's, uh, people like the word relevant. I think it's as relevant as ever, so. Oh, certainly, um, certainly, yeah. And by the way, the re reason I suggested it um, as, as a film for uh, you to review was that I, I know that Italian films um, had been something of a specialty of yours. Um, and uh, while this is an American film, it was made by an Italian director. And I think the vision of the film is, uh, you know, it's it's a very much a European vision of America. Oh, certainly. And I didn't I didn't know that Carlo Ponti produced it. So it still had uh, some Italian blood, even on the production side. But mm -hmm. the one thing that that stood out to me in the uh, the essay you wrote on Mark Frechette was that you know, he hated the film and it seemed as if he wanted like a literal, a literal adaptation of what was going on and, and that he didn't like that. It, this was more of like a European impression of, of what was going on. But like you said in, in your essay, why, why not? Why not have some, an outsider interpret uh, the, the, the politics and the events of the day? And I think there's a lot of things that he, if it, anyone knows about that time <laughs> and very much how it resembles today, I think what what he saw was pretty accurate. I mean, in terms of just people not being able to get along at all. I mean, you see off the top these revolutionaries, uh, Black Panthers and and Black revolutionists and the white students, and they're all arguing about what to do. And the Mark Freshette, it's interesting because he's just like I'm bored. <laughs> he walks well, out. He's a Go dropout. Ahead. You know, I was anticipating your, your, your because usually you, you ask me, you know, what do you think this film is about? And, and yeah. I think this film is about war. Um, I, I, broadly, I, I, uh, uh, because it's about a lot of things. It actually, it's, it's, it actually is elusive. Um, it, there's a lot of subtlety in it, and um, it, it, it doesn't lend itself, I think, to uh, some of the usual interpretive uh, techniques. Uh, so to get in here and talk about, you know, this character, this and this character, that it's a little. Yeah, he doesn't shove it down your throat. I would agree. It's more subtle and poetic. But it's it's it, it is a work. It's it's a poem. The film is a, is, a, is a visual and yeah. I think sonic poem as well. But the poem is about um, the war at home um, in, in America. Yeah, um, it's it's uh, 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 it's uh, there. There's uh, a war being fought about the war. Um, in in Vietnam, but there, but uh, but also uh, there there is a war being fought about, for example, uh, racial inequity. I mean, it's right. significant that uh, that the that this event that uh, sends Mark into the desert uh, into the film, um, uh, the police are, are coming after some black revolutionaries who are holed up in a library, right. uh, and um, and uh, later uh, Mark makes a, a kind of joke about John Brown. Um, you, you know, the John Brown, the, uh, 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 the you know, that whole uh, thing, uh, Harper's Ferry that took place, uh, uh, I can't remember now if it was before the Civil War or during the Civil War, uh, but of course, you know, he was this big, uh, I can't think of the name uh, right now, uh, you know, anti-slavery. Um, right. <laughs> well, just, just piggybacking on that, I also like when, when he gets arrested and he gives the cop his name as Karl Marx and they don't know who that is, clearly. He's arrested and and yes, he's asked for his name. He says Karl Marx and the uh, the police clerk uh, spells Karl with a C. We C A R L. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> it just shows so much about the the ignorance and you know uh, people's <laughs> lack of education uh, that they would put C as opposed to K uh, for Karl. I have. Um, is um, a book by a friend of mine wrote called the Antonioni Adventure. Oh, my friend's name is George Pecori, and he has an essay in here about uh, Zabriskie Point. It literally says the plot. The plot: Mark's roommate participates in a student demonstration at his college against the Vietnam War and is arrested by police. Mark attempts to bail him out, but is himself arrested, giving his name to the clerk in the police department as Karl Marx, which he officially typed out with the Americanized spelling, uh, as mentioned a minute ago. Um, sometime later on the same campus, as things have reached boiling point, 
A policeman is shot and killed. Mark is seen with a gun and is hunted by the police as the presumed killer. And although Antonioni shows us that Mark was not the killer, uh, he leaves out enough information so there must be an element of doubt. Mark goes on the run to the South Bay area of Los Angeles, then a working class section of the city, and stops at the Hawthorne Airport where he steals a private plane. Daria Hoffman, who's the girl in the film, is a temporary girl Friday in one of the modern office buildings in downtown Los Angeles that houses the Sunny Dunes Corporation, a real estate firm that is invested in the outlying desert as the next spot for suburban migration. Mark flies to the desert and spots Daria driving to a mansion for a meeting with her boss. He lands his plane in the middle of the desert. The two meet and become a couple. Uh, he then paints his plane in psychedelic colors, flies back to the airport where he stole the plane and is shot by waiting police. Daria goes to the meeting in the desert, but when she hears of Mark's death on the radio, she decides to leave. Before going off alone, she imagines the house and all the objects in it blowing up, which we see in slow motion. Yeah. That's much longer uh, description <laughs> than, you're, than you usually do. That's okay. But yeah, no, that's girl, at least everybody will know exactly what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah, or... that's what happens. But what is it about? That's the question. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, the this this whole aspect of I, I mean, I love the first half because it's it's quite noisy and aggressive until he gets on that plane and which was a clear metaphor for I got to get the fuck out of here because everyone down below on the ground, so to speak, is insane uh, or can't get along. And so I, I just love, because I my first thought was, well, how does he know how to fly a plane? Well, not that it matters. It doesn't have to be literal. If it's, it's, it has a surrealist quality. I know that Antonioni read in, a, it was based on a real life incident that someone actually did that, just took this plane, brought it back and then was shot. So, you know, again, it, it's not lit. It doesn't have to be literal to why he, how he do how to fly a plane. Does it, it doesn't matter. But I, what I, what I liked so much was that once he, you know, he finds, he sees Daria, you know, he's, he's tracking her with the plane being flirtatious as he goes over her car, driving, <laughs> flying over her car as she drives to Phoenix. And this whole meeting at the Zab Zabriskie Point, Death Valley, um, it's it's like you said in the essay. It's like an Adam. It's like an Adam and Eve type of fantasy. It's like they get back to the salt of the earth. Uh, uh, this is back to innocence of just love and and sex and simplicity and beauty and just being uh, together without all these complexities of the real world. Uh, I mean, I thought that was quite tender. I mean, it was. It's interesting to me that how much that was mocked. Uh, or criticized that that it, that it, people just thought it was like I said Ebert that it was stupid or that that there that people felt the performances weren't very good and that their interaction wasn't very good. I I really don't get don't get that because I thought he the way in which he shot it, uh, utilizing all those other people as they gradually more and more uh, hippies are showing up having sex and then that wide shot where there's you know so many of these people. It's such a it's a surrealist fantasy. And it was so clear um, that it was necessary for these people to just escape, get back to the salt of the earth, so to speak. And then before you know it, the reality creeps right in and he and he goes back and 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 gets killed. You know, why does he go back? That's that's sort of up to the audience. I don't is how you saw that whole desert scene as like a, an escape for for them like a dreamlike escape that they're just like i i can't function in this the way the world america is going at this moment well uh he's uh, literally within the, the plot uh, you know as as i just read it i mean um um daria is is going to meet her boss um yeah like, uh, rod taylor uh clearly he has designs on her um, yeah he's trying to track her down even before like where is she she didn't show up to work i wasn't sure if she actually was going to i thought it was a little like mark where she was just taking off kind of like just let me just drive and see where i wind up it's not so clear i mean then later on she says no i'm going to be my boss i thought maybe she was torn about what exactly she wanted where she was going to go uh but anyways uh continue where where your thoughts oh, uh, were there Marcus is literally in in flight because uh, he's uh, a suspect uh, or the prime suspect in the killing of this policeman on campus. 
Um, but I think, uh, and I, I, he is already, uh, I mean, he's literally a dropout already. He's a college dropout. Um, I think Mark and Dar Daria kind of uh, represent um, uh, Antonioni's, um, you know, they're an idealized couple. They represent, I think, in a way, the, the, the best of, of that generation to Antonioni. Um, uh, because uh, Mark is is uh, not an ideologue uh, in in the film. Um, you, you know, we see that uh, if that uh, the 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 war room meeting at the beginning of the film, at the meeting of the Black Panthers and the New Left, um, yeah. Mark uh, dro drops out of the meeting after uh, yeah. uh, sort of declaring his you know he's he's, he's more by all this uh, this revolutionary rhetoric. Yeah. Um, so, um, uh, so he's it, it. It could be argued sort of smarter than the rest because he knows that this is all, uh, you know, bullshit. Yeah, uh, exactly. That word about it. Um, uh, you know, these kids are masquerading as revolutionaries. I mean, certainly the white kids. I mean, they're even at, at that meeting raising their hands and saying, you know, huh, excuse me, Black Panthers, how do I how do I become a revolutionary, a real? Yeah. <laughs> um, or they're complaining about getting like busted for weed and i like <laughs> one of the black panthers is like yeah well you know in other you know we we get we get killed for nothing and you're complaining because you got arrested because you had some pots <laughs> right, right um but uh, it's another so, version of like what people would call today white privilege i suppose which i know some people hate that word that phrase but it reminded me of that well um uh so daria um, uh, it's, it's different from, from Mark. Um, uh, she's, uh, she explains to the Rod Taylor character at the beginning of the film that, uh, she just works as a girl Friday for the bread, you know, when I need some bread. Yeah. Uh, so she's a hippie girl. She's not an ideologue. Um, um, she um, uh, it, it, when she drives out to meet her boss, she's she's driving. She's on her way to Phoenix, um, um, and it, uh, she uh, she stops in the small town. Uh, she's looking for uh, a commune. Um, she's heard about this commune that's supposed to be out in the desert, and and um, um, uh, and she's looking for a place to meditate. Um, but I I think in a sense. Um, uh, uh, Los Angeles is presented in the film as a kind of uh, 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 battleground, as a as a sort of uh, 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 there's a, there's a war going on there, um, a yeah. war against the environment in a sense. I mean, you know, the, there's that sequence where Marcus driving around LA and you hear these mechanical sounds and you see all these 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 signs, um, um, uh, all those advertised right. advertisement signs all over the place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, and of course, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 it, it looks like a police state. I mean, the police seem to be sort of everywhere. You keep, you know, there are a number of moments in the film with helicopters, you know, which we associate with the Vietnam War now. And I think, you know, yeah. the war are they going to associate with the war? Um, the Vietnam War was a helicopter war. Um, and, um, uh, and so um, I, I see Mark and Daria as these sort of, um, um, and people fleeing the war in a way, escaping from the war. They're refugees in a sense, or they they have the sort of this momentary reprieve. Mm. Um, they sort of go where you know there there are no people. I mean, they can in a sense start over. That's why yeah. refer in the essay to um, Zabriskie Point is a kind of fossilized Garden of Eden. Um, and um, um, <laughs> So it, uh, if these two gorgeous people, um, you know, were to produce, I mean, child um, and restart the human race, I guess, uh, uh, from Antonioni's point of view, I mean, we, you know, maybe, you know, we'd all, we'd all be much better off. Uh, <laughs> not, only, not only gorgeous, but, uh, um, but, um, you, you know, they have, uh, from his point of view, the right values. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, and they're, they're smarter than other people, I guess, in, in, on, some, on some level. Anyway, well, they had they had such great, like you were like you were saying. I mean, yeah, they were they were very both very attractive, but they had such distinct qualities that really stood out. And I, I know that 
Mark Frechette, like you pointed out in the essay, was cast like because he was screaming at someone at a bus stop in L.A. Uh, no, it was it's in Boston. It was in Boston. Oh, sorry, uh, it was in Boston. He, he um, was living in Boston, and he yeah. just to tell the story because it's quite a story. I mean, he really was a very troubled guy already. Oh. Know? God, yeah. It was a whole thing. He'd been institutionalized uh, after being molested by a priest. He, he had dropped out of uh, school, uh, began to burgle houses. Uh, his parents had him uh, carried off to uh, a mental institution. He escaped the mental institution. Um, and uh, he was very eager to join this uh, cult at the time, but the, the cult wasn't interested in him. Um, uh, the the, the so-called Lyman family in Boston. And um, one day he was was at a bus stop. There was a sailor arguing with his girlfriend um, at the bus stop uh, loudly. And uh, somebody from uh, a, a building, a nearby building, uh, stood in the window, a man, and, and started shouting at the sailor and his girlfriend and threw a geranium at them. And Mark shouted at the man in the window, motherfucker, and was trying to get into the building. And suddenly this man sort of came up behind him and said, uh, how old are you? And Mark said, 20, said, come <laughs> with me. And Mark followed him to a limousine um, where Antonioni's assistant was in the limousine. They were looking to cast his part. They could not find anybody who yeah. was what Antonioni had in mind. Uh, yeah. Antonioni had already spotted Daria dancing nude in a, a sort of uh, a, a pseudo or semi-documentary. about Documentary, the right. Um, and so uh, that's how Mark got cast. I'm sorry, it's just well, like it's a, interesting. a funny story that uh, it just has to sort of be included in its entire. Oh no, certainly. I mean, it's it's like out of the 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 classic ho old Hollywood period of being, you know, discovered in a swimming pool or at a soda fountain, which which yeah. happened occasionally. Yeah. And 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 this happened with him. It's interesting though because Antonioni, because he had he had so much anger, was was why they which was a big selling point, uh, but yet he's not very angry in this film. I mean, he's, I mean, perhaps they just couldn't get that uh, out of him because I saw him as being more uh, withdrawn and, and giving up on life to an extent because, you know, he, he, he's, he's suspected of, of killing this cop. He goes into this plane and, <laughs> and flies away and then, and then brings it back. And so the question is, you know, why does he bring it back? I mean, he says he likes to take risks. There's even that scene where the police officer shows up and he's he's questioning Daria and he's hiding behind uh, the those one outside porta potties with the gun mm -hmm. uh, and there's no bullets in it. So, uh, you know, is does he wanting to get killed? Does he want to get killed? Is that, is that an opportunity to just be done away with so he's not going to get killed back home? Uh, I saw I saw him as just kind of giving up on on life i mean that's why I, you, the fact that people criticize his his their performance so much as being flat I, I i really felt that was part of of at least for him just being like america's broken and i'm 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 done and this was his last hurrah out in the in the desert i don't know if that's how, how you saw it but i certainly felt that's what i mean that's a possibility anyways well i think that mark and Dari were not professional actors Right. And um, um, Antonio, uh, Antonioni was following the, the neorealist neo -real, tradition. Yeah, non-professionals. Uh, casting, yes, non-professional actors in the parts. And um, Antonioni, his, his, his films are never marked by uh, uh, violent emotion in people, um, uh, you know, violent expression of emotion. Uh, uh, the, the performances in his films tend to be uh, a bit muted or yeah. very muted. And uh, they're just sort of, uh, the, the Mark and Dari in the film are just, uh, uh, you know, uh, going along with uh, uh, the program, uh, the usual, uh, I think, Antonioni program. Um, I wish that uh, Antonioni had, had um, let them improvise uh, because instead uh, they have to repeat this, uh, um, uh, this dialogue, uh, um, which was not written by Sam Shepard, although Sam Shepard uh, wrote uh, uh, either an outline or an early draft of the script. Um, it was written, I think, by this man named Fred Gardner. Um, I don't even know that this person was a, a, a screenwriter or a playwright or anything like that. I think he was a, an ideologue. So you, you know, the, the lines are the lines themselves are a bit stiff. Um, 
And um, so I, I sort of wish that uh, Antonioni had just, uh, you know, let them say whatever they wanted to say. Um, you, yeah. Yeah, I agree. Right, Perhaps, right yeah, before, yeah. right before, and after they make love, you there are you. So there's some interesting moments where you can kind of, you know, they're Mark and Daria are talking to, they're kind of talking to each other. Uh, you don't really hear what they say, but she's giggling. She has a great giggle. Mm. Uh, and and he, Mark is like blah 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 blah, and she's like hee hee hee, and and uh, I wish there had been more of that because that was you know entirely spontaneous. But instead, they're kind of you know as they say, regurgitating all these uh, lines. In terms of why Mark uh, 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 returns the plane, um, I think yes, uh, um, it's almost as if he can see that this uh, revolutionary movement is going to fail. Um, so uh, you know uh, he. You know, he he may be, uh, 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 you know, is strangely a bit uh, suicidal, um, mm. but but also I I think that also I think the point is that he's he he took the plane he borrowed the plane he did not steal the plane he borrowed it and he is more moral um, than the people from whom uh, in a sense he borrowed it I mean or or let's just put it this way. He is murdered. We see the police murder. Um, it's yeah. people in the film. Um, we see earlier in the film, um, that's actual documentary footage. All that blood we see. I was it, wondering, because it. Lo I was like, that can't be. No. Antonioni. Yeah, that looked went, real. Went to, Antonioni went to um, actual strikes demonstrations and he shot um, yeah. demonstrations. And um, and you see people covered in blood. Oh this yeah, at the hands of the police. Um, the the I'm I'm a, I'm sorry to say because I am not anti-police necessarily. I mean I, I recognize that you know the police are sort of a necessary evil. Um, yeah. But um, but um, uh, but uh, the LA police at that time, the police in in, the, in this area were you know known to be particularly brutal. Um, right. And, um, you know, that continued up until there was some reform, you know, following the, the Rodney King thing, Daryl Gates stepped down. I don't know if Daryl Gates was police chief at that time, but um, they, they were bad. They were bad. Right. Uh, and and um, uh, so, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, I, That's I, a good I, point. I mean, he has more of a conscience in the sense that he's you know, wanting to repent or something, you know, or something along the lines of, or, or maybe he just took it, not even necessarily knowing what the hell he just had to get off the ground. And it was a spontaneous uh, move, you know, uh, I don't think it was necessarily calculated. Uh, but again, what I like is that he's, he's not, he's not feeding the audience. He's not telling you why everyone is doing everything. Yeah. He's, he's, right. he's removing uh, the motivations. And so you can, fill in your own possibilities uh possibilities there which again i'm not surprised th that uh, for an american audience that would have been <laughs> I, I'm, not, I'm not surprised that they 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 didn't take to it because it is more of a european art house uh way not that there weren't american mavericks that were like that but certainly not an MGM produced mainstream <laughs> movie. Uh, you know, I don't think the masses were going to necessarily uh, uh, take to it. Uh, but I, I, you know, again, I, I, I like them in it, and and I reckon. I mean, I think I think people have a hard time accepting th those kind of performances. Uh, because we're so used to getting, you know, into the depths of characters and emotion and um, people don't necessarily like sort of slow movies where you have to go to the movies more than they go to you, uh, you know, generally speaking. So I'm not surprised people attack them. And at the same time, they were non-professionals. It's an easy, it's an easier way to just be like, you know, look, you got these guys who don't know what they're doing and they sucked. Uh, on top of the fact that I didn't like the movie. <laughs> but like I said, I, I quite liked it. I was curious what you thought of the, you, we touched on the scene where Daria goes to this ghost town and she's she's looking for this guy in order to meditate. Um, that was an interesting scene because she's talking to these these men who look like a hundred you know one guy's is like i was the heavyweight champion in 1920 and once daria leaves 
he goes back in the bar and for about three seconds, he lingers on one of those men drinking a beer. And it was almost as if time had stood still for these people. I was curious what you thought that was about. I think it was an interesting scene. Well, I think, I believe, I could be wrong, um, that that was uh, something put into the film uh, or, or uh, that was uh, uh, Sam Shepard. Uh, um, what's the word, product um, uh, that survived. Um, Shepard grew up, uh, grew up uh, in the Southern California desert. Um, uh, I, it, my friend George, uh, in, in this, this, this book here, um, that that's sort of a, a, uh, a, a nod to a bygone America. America. Um, uh, you, you know, uh, 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 Patty Page's uh, Tennessee Waltz is playing uh, during that scene, um, and it, it, he says it's a it, it's a, a tribute to bygone America that uh, oh I see that, that no America that no um, uh, American director uh, thought to to do at the time, um, and um, um, it, it's interesting that Darius is is uh, driving a, a dated car, um, you know her car I think dates from yeah. It's a really old car. I was wondering about that as well. But um, I think um, uh, you know, I, I you know, I have some thoughts about it. Uh, uh, you know, first of all, it seems to be a town without women, um, so it's a town destined to die out. Um, ah, you know, right. These very old men. There, I mean, there, there are no, there don't appear to be, you know, any middle-aged people or, or uh, young adults in the film. No. You have. Uh, these, these Other old... than those kids who were like brought there apparently from California, oh. who then attack her, yeah, which well, was they... also interesting. <laughs> yeah, the, the real life little rascals. Um, <laughs> we see what the what street urchins are really like. I mean, they they sort of a, attempt to sexually assault her, although they're not yeah. sexually mature. They say something like, you know, can I have a piece of ass or something? Yeah, do you know what to do with it? And then they all start like they throw the <laughs> you know, grab her skirt and right and away screaming. Um, but um, um, I, I think in a way that we, we see that town because uh, earlier in the film, we see this um, advertisement uh, being made by the Sunny Dunes real estate people, uh, mm -hmm. which have dummies portraying human, you know, human beings who are, who are living this idyllic suburban life out in the yeah. desert. And then I think we see the reality of what a desert a town uh, uh, in the middle of the desert is, is really like. Yeah. Um, uh, why are there no women in the town? Because maybe because, you know, women would all have the sense of like, I'm getting the hell out of here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> leaving exactly. behind these stubborn, idiotic men. Um, but I think in a way we see um, what that world is really like, as opposed to the sort of corporate vision. Oh, right. That world. I see. Um, yeah. and, and, or, or what that corporate vision is destined to become. If mm. it were ever implemented, Inevitably, it would be, become like this, um, this place with, you know, urchins and, uh, you know, uh, 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 sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, people on the verge of death, um, you know, just kind of hanging on, just, you know, kind of just barely hanging on to life. Um, yes. Because it's not a place that sustains life, uh, really. Um, although Daria does, it's a risky point comment about a flower growing or, or plant. She goes, look at that plant over there or something like that. And there are a few plants that are able to survive. But I mean, most of what we see out there is just rock and sand. Um, right. Well, what I what I like so much about that that scene where they're watching that commercial was it, it was almost as if I mean all those businessmen were so apathetic about everything else that was going on that they were only looking to see how they could take advantage of it because the commercial was like selling people on hey let's get out of the city you know and it was all this thing of you see this hell that's going on well let's get away from it and go live and so again it's it's these people thinking how can i take advantage of this and even that great scene in the rod taylor and and the other gentleman uh i forget his name he's in like a lot of coppola's films godfather jd spradlin jd spradlin that's it JD um yeah. everything on the radio is about this hell that's going on and they're talking about something completely different which was just their business interests and even at the end uh i mean i thought it was quite it was interesting metaphoric shot has they're looking at the diagram of their plans and you see their reflection on this black 
diagram as if they're just these few men ruling over well, this, this whole desert. And that's exactly what they were doing. I thought again, they're, they're oligarchs. They're oligarchs. Exactly. And and and, and, and the police serve them. Um, yes, and, exactly. Um, so that's the idea. Is it's it's sort of a war between um, you know, the idea the I, 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 uh, idealistic youth and these yes. oligarchs and their and their henchmen, the police. You know, essentially that's that's sort of what Mark uh, uh, is, is, is and Dario are sort of getting away from, and and they have sort of cr created this sort of dystopian hell. <laughs> exactly. Um, although we do see one shot. This is kind of interesting. With their, their, because the, the the movie, I mean, not that not that it, it matters even you know remotely. The few sort of, the movie has sort of a confused, a somewhat confused sense of L.A. geography because at one point uh, uh, the Mark and his roommate and, uh, are driving around, um, and uh, they pass um, um, the the uh, Benedict Canyon, the entrance to Benedict Canyon. I mean, you have all those uh, palm trees kind of all in a row, and you can see the sign right there, um, and um, um, and that looks rather lush. That does not look like an urban hell, but it's it's interesting that 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 shot is in the film. Uh, that's where where Mark says he sees his sister, so it's implied he's from the area. Maybe I, I I'm not sure if he was. You're, you're supposed to take him seriously. If, if this girl who waves at him is his sister or not, but I I think we are. I think we are we are meant to think that that's really his sister. Um, but uh, you know, but uh, you know, a year later um, after this was shot, because I think a lot of the film was shot in '68, uh, um, a little bit in '69. Uh, but uh, the, the Manson killers, um, you know, would have uh, driven right up that road uh, to get right. uh, Sharon Tate. And that was one of the, you know, it's, it, it, one of the, um, uh, you, you know, one of the um, climactic uh, moments of the 1960s in America, I think in the world, too. Uh, oh, really. yeah. I mean, people used to say that Manson was the man who killed the 60s. Right. So it was that event. And then the, the Kent State killings that came, you know, right after uh, this uh, Zabriskie Point was released. That Right. Uh, yeah, in a yeah. sense, in a sense, the ending of the blowing up of all of those uh, little—I don't even know—when I mean, their homes in the desert that they that they built, uh, in a sense, that was almost a a warning, you know, or or a premon a premonition, almost like you guys, if if, you, if this country doesn't get their shit together, this is where 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 things are heading. And so you mentioned those two events, and I know in the essay you mentioned, you know, fast forward fifty years later, and it's it's all happening again it's the same very much the same issues and so i think antonioni and the screenwriters here were certainly on to something i know that's meant to be her fantasy uh because he he first shoots it quietly where you don't hear anything and it cuts back to her face and then she gets out of the car and then you see i think i mean jesus christ that must have been a scary shot if they didn't get it you know they had like the I don't shot know, was seven, there was it was a it was a a model of the, of this house which i think was already yeah. standing um, it's it's a, a a kind of dome. The house is a it, it, uh, it's quite quite interesting. Um, but um, they had, it was shot. The model was shot. The explosion was shot with seventeen cameras, and we see this. We yes. see the explosion happen again and again. Yeah. Um, I don't think that um, it's just a warning. <clears throat> um, George points out, my friend George, in his essay, um, that uh, in, in a sense, um, um, uh, this this. Um, this apocalypse uh, that that uh, that uh, Daria imagines. Um, this is the culmination of um, uh, 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 a fantasy of apocalypse that uh, that the world had had for a long time. You know, since the since uh, the introduction of uh, the uh, atomic bomb. Uh, you know, destruction of of the planet by uh, nuclear war. Um, but um, I think it's also it's obviously a wish fulfillment for for um, uh, for Daria. Um, uh, right. It, it, but but I think it's a, it, it's a it's meant to be a kind of wish fulfillment on on the part of the audience too because we're 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 seeing the destruction of all this this shit this stuff that enslaves us. Exactly. Uh, it's right. A, it's the destruction of um, um, uh, of a consumer society. That's what mm. we're seeing. Uh, apparently, although the film uh, was again, as you say. Uh, reviled the time of its release. Apparently, there is a shot of a uh, of a man speaking on television, uh, a talking head, 
and uh, the television explodes. And apparently when that happened um, in 1970, people would applaud in the audience uh, to see oh. it being destroyed. Um, you know, we, we see food being destroyed. We see clothes being destroyed, a right. clothes crack being destroyed. We see, right. um, as uh, uh, again, as my friend George points out in his essay, uh, we see books explode. That was one thing that really bothered me um, I remember when I first saw the film at uh, 18 or whatever I was at the time, um, um, and I, 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 but it was yeah uh, the books we need. <laughs> well, <laughs> we need the books. George points out that uh, you know it's it's the idea of collecting books because we see a shelf of books. Oh, I get <laughs> it. The yeah. idea of the of, appearance of, of looking smart rather than of, actually reading. <laughs> well, books as as as. Um, consumerous objects right i see um, i see uh you, you know um i mean in a sense if you you own a book it's a kind of trophy um you, you know i mean i mean if you read a book and you still have it it's it's kind of like a mounted head on the wall you know right, like I, right. Oh, I kill that animal slash i i read that book you know uh, right right but, um, right but uh, anyway um it's not really about wanting to be educated it's the it's the look how great i am look at all these books look at all this well, that's, that's one what's way that of book called that. that your friend you wrote that's, a, oh, that's i'd like to read that it sounds Antonioni interesting the owning adventure okay i'm gonna look that up yeah it's 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 a, the, the the essay i couldn't quite get through it all last night um but uh it's it's uh, it has a lot of insight i think into the film and and um uh, and it, it, the whole obviously the whole book is about antonioni and i think the film has to be um, uh, really, in a way, viewed um, as uh, you know, one chapter, if you will, uh, in the work of Antonioni. It has a lot of uh, characteristics in common with uh, other Antonioni films. Antonioni oh, certainly. returns certainly. to desert again and again. I mean, he was he was he was interested in these. You know, he's a landscape filmmaker. You know, he he's uh, very interested in. in uh, uh, yeah. You know, landscape. Yeah. Well, he he too. drew his whole life, and he I dabbled in painting, but. I mean, he was he was clearly interested in presenting his his films visually uh, to the I mean, in this one, it's 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 to the point where it could be a silent film. I mean, his, his other movies are more psychologically uh, complex, in, in my view, this, this one is more of for me, more of a political film. But that doesn't put anything down about it. It's just it's just a different uh, expression and focus but i mean you could take all the all the dialogue and it would still be just as powerful mm -hmm. uh well, I, I say feel. that i say that in the essay um, yeah See, because, i stole uh, that from you he's <laughs> no I, i'm not saying that but uh Daria right, no, no. Said, said later that uh when she was asked about the film uh, whatever it was 15 years later she said something like well i you know i wish i wish i hadn't spoken or, or something you know i wish i'd been silent in the film but, that's right yeah uh, but I, you know, uh, uh, I point out that it, it, in a way, it doesn't really matter what she, uh, she and Mark say in the film. Um, no, it doesn't matter. I don't at think all. dialogue really matters much in the film at all. It, it, no, uh, it could be, uh, it could be a sound film. I mean, it, it, you know, to me, effectively, it kind of is one. Um, although yeah. sound is very important to the film, music is very important. Oh, yeah, certainly. And and um, this was you made at a time when the 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 soundtrack comprised only of of um uh you know rock and roll songs and and popular songs so that was unusual right got pink floyd uh mm -hmm. played they, on it and well they wrote music expressly for the film in fact right. um antonioni went to a few bands including the doors um and asked him to write uh, songs for the film but uh, uh the, the the door song uh lamerica was uh, rejected um and uh, by the way, uh, uh, that uh, that uh, Pink Floyd um, um, song at the beginning and the end, it has that. Ch -ch 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 -ch. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, that uh, that's where the Friday the Thirteenth. Uh, ch -ch 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 that's where that I did was not know that. from. It was taken from that. Oh God, I did not know that. That was so haunting. Mm. The 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 feel of it and creepy. It almost it felt like a horror out of a horror film. Uh, so, so I'm not surprised. Uh, I was curious, uh, why did Mark Frechette interest you to write an essay about in the book? Well, so, some of the essays 
in the book, I I explained sort of, you know, why I wrote about them. I decided I didn't want every essay to be like that. So I didn't really get into why with him. Um, it was because uh, that um, uh, uh, story that I saw uh, in the newspaper about him as a kid uh, just stuck with me. I just found it so fascinating that... Um, um, that, uh, 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 I mean, how, you know, how many film stars, and he was briefly a film star, he right. was in the Rolling Stone and Look Magazine, he was photographed for Vogue. Yeah, um, and he did a few other films that, like you mentioned, later. One of them in was Italy. Good, actually, yeah. Uh, many yeah, I wanted to check them out because they it's sounded really appealing. Well, you won't find yes. the other one. The other one is, I, okay. I have a copy of it somewhere. Uh, it's It was never... Yeah, uh, well, maybe maybe you speak Italian. It's it's uh, it's all on a. I mean, it was never. Oh, there's no Italian. subtitles. Um, but um, no, I just thought it was just a, an interesting story, um, and um, uh, because you know after uh, the film, he you know as you say he did go off and and um, um, uh, make uh, uh, two other films, uh, but he you know. Uh, uh, became a member in good standing of this cult, uh, the Fort Hill community, um, or uh, Lyman family, uh, right. as, as they were later dubbed, and they accepted that name. Uh, their leader corresponded with Charles Manson in prison, um, and um, and um, uh, you know they they all worked as carpenters, um, or they they became carpenters because they were living in these uh, kind of dilapidated uh, Victorian houses in Boston originally, and uh, they they sort of had to become carpenters in order to kind of fix these places up to make them even somewhat livable, um, and later that uh, they became uh, uh, quite successful uh, as carpenters. Uh, uh, they had a, a Fort Hill. Uh, carpentry company or something they bought uh, they were very prescient about real estate they went around they bought real estate uh um, they had branches in new york and san francisco la uh, mark and Dar mark and daria became a couple uh during the making of zabriskie point and then right. and then mark got her to join the stupid cult um and they moved to boston um uh, and then they were sent uh to la um oh they actually they live in new york briefly uh, at, the, at the branch in new york um, they went out there, um, and then uh, it just uh, Daria uh, was just, I, I think, too much of an individualist um, it, to kind of fit in, which is what happens. I mean, cults always bounce the people uh, out of them that can think completely for themselves. Mark was not a dumb guy. I just think that he uh, he 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 was looking for a place. Um, uh, you know, he had been you know institutionalized by his parents. Yeah. Uh, he couldn't, he couldn't couldn't very well go go home um and um um he was very idealistic and i i think the cult um uh, kind of um um uh, 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 suited his emotional needs um yeah uh, made him feel safe was my impression uh yeah, based on these terrible things that happened to him growing up with yeah. the priest and everything well he was looking i think for a father figure um right Called it Mel Lyman, although Mel Lyman was the leader of the cult. <laughs> Mel Lyman was not that much much older than 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 Mark. I mean, not significantly older, but nevertheless, he was the father figure, I think, to all those 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 people. Um, uh, and um, and so uh, uh, Daria left uh, the the cult. Uh, with uh, got away, she tried to get Mark to to, to go with her. Uh, he did leave briefly. Um, uh, but inevitably, uh, he, he returned to the fold, and uh, she went on to marry uh, Dennis Hopper. <laughs> I, yeah, well, I did. I forgot about that. I yeah. didn't. I was like, oh my, who did he not marry? <laughs> oh. um, and then she left him because he was he was insane at the time, right? Uh, um, and um, and uh, uh, and then uh, finally, uh, for reasons that no one quite understands, uh, Mark uh, robbed a bank or attempted to rob a bank. He had actually uh, successfully um, collected the money. I mean, he, I mean, when you rob a bank, you have to do it fast. You are in and out, man. Yeah, you know? he was like, there for like eight minutes. Yeah, he was, they were in there like, you know, <laughs> um, how do you open the safe? <laughs> hey, you, could you know the safe number? Uh, <sighs> of, I mean, it wasn't quite that bad, but it was almost that bad. Uh, they had no idea what they were doing. Uh, one, uh, 
um, idea that has been put forward um, as uh, the motive for the robbery was that Mark was attempting to raise money for a film. For a film, right. Um, I talked to the guy who was supposed to direct the film um, and uh, and they were, it was, a, it was an adaptation of Crime and Punishment, Dostoevsky's uh, Crime and Punishment. Um, and they had worked on it quite a bit. They used to get together and talk about the script. Mark had a lot of input into everything. He didn't, you know, I think that was one of his frustrations was a risky point was that he didn't feel that, you know, his input was as welcomed because right. obviously Tony, you, know, you can just tell from, from, from uh, his films that he was a control freak. I mean, most film directors are control freaks. Um, yeah. <laughs> and so, um, I mean, that's why they're film directors. Um, and so um, Mark finally had, you know, uh, a, 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 a serious filmmaker, a guy, a guy uh, from, uh, uh, who had run away from Hungary because he made political films there that got him into trouble with the government. Uh, he, you know, immigrated to the United States and, and he and Mark were getting together all the time and um, talking about this thing. And they were trying to raise money. They had been promised some money uh, by some con con men um, who did not, obviously did not have the money. And so Mark was ordered by uh, uh, Mel Lyman, I guess, uh, to go back to Boston. Um, and um, um, and he ended up robbing this bank. He called uh, the director in L.A. Uh, the day before he robbed the bank and said, "I'm going to be in L.A. tomorrow with the money." So that would seem to be the motive. Um, but later, they, he blamed it on Watergate, and then a lot of people believe he was put up to it by Mel Lyman. Um, there was a book about um, this, uh, about the Lyman family. It was published. I can't think of the name of it. It's written by Ryan Walsh. Um, I have it here somewhere. Um, Astral, Astral Weeks. Um, and um, I had an exchange with Ryan Walsh about this, and he, he, um, he said he was told again and again that uh, uh, that the, the, the robbery, uh, you know, was at the direction of, of um, Mel Lyman. Um, he was told this by by people from within the family, but but uh, I, I I don't know. I mean, um, if that were so, uh, you know, why would Mark have uh, called uh, this director in L.A. the yeah, day before? And yeah, I, I I don't know. It's it's all um, no one really knows, but Mark blamed it on Watergate. <laughs> and, um, the robbery, I think, was meant to be a kind of political theater. Um, the Lyman family said that the guns that were used in the robbery were not loaded. Um, in fact, um, um, I think that um, they were loaded, uh, but th there was a, a bullet missing in the first chamber, which, uh, you know, which is a bit odd. You were talking earlier about Mark in the film, as a risky point, pointing a gun at a cop. He said the gun was not loaded. That's not true. It, uh, he he uh the policeman drives away and uh, uh daria runs up to mark and says are you crazy you know is that loaded and he says nope and he opens the, the chamber oh, yeah he, he takes the bullets out, out. that's right that's them, right drops them so that so right. the gun was loaded in fact right um but um but yeah he 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 robbed this bank and then um he, he, you know, he was sent to prison. He became very depressed in prison, very depressed. And uh, he would, you know, he wasn't eating and he died uh, from uh, um, what was, uh, what the, the prison said was uh, a weightlifting accident. He was found uh, in a rec room. With yeah, a, dropped under, it on his neck, right? On his neck, but that's the way they found Oof. it. Jeez. Um, but, um, but of course, you know, there are rumors about that too. Um, right, right. Seriously for everything. Uh, in today's world, uh, yeah, that's, that's been that way for a long time. Um, but um, I, I don't know. Possibly it is true that uh, that uh, you know that Mark, uh, you know, somebody did you know killed Mark. Uh, you know, we'll never know. Or he. We'll or, never know. Yeah. I know. I mean, I I know you went through all. You know, you you really thoroughly went through a lot of uh, possibilities with that and and the bank robbery. And I guess people could draw their own conclusions, but. Uh, again, I was I reread the essay and was just li literally absorbed in it. It's such a fascinating, it's such a fascinating essay. So if anyone uh, hasn't read this book, Death Valley Superstars, it's it's such a great read. And and that it, I, it's probably one of my favorites is the Mark Frechette now. And I, oh. I, I rewatched his great <laughs> his interview, their interview on Dick Cavett, which you mentioned, yeah. which is so awkward <laughs> in a memorable way. Uh, I love that, uh, which, which anyone, I'll leave the link in the description box if anyone wants to see it 
which is is so so great. Uh, but yeah, if you haven't read it, highly recommend getting it. I guess people can get it. Uh, I know there's the uh, digital Everybody copy on Amazon. Any we well, can get it anywhere. You can get it. I mean, you can order it through a bookstore or whatever. Um, I did want to say one thing about go ahead um, about Zabriskie Point. Um, uh, I I see the film in a way as a part of a sort of unwitting trilogy um, of films made about LA by great European directors. The other two uh, directors are uh, Agnes uh, Varda oh, and her right. husband Jacques Demy, and the films are Lion's Love and Model Shot. Um, I still vision, have to see both of those, and I, I plan to, because I really want to. They're really great. Um, Lion's Love is, is kind of wacky, um, um, but uh, but I, I really like the film quite a bit. Uh, Model Shop is just a, a for me is just a gorgeous gorgeous film, um, and um, so is Lion's Love for me. But uh, but they these films present um, a a, 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 a portraits of L.A. at that time, uh, along with Zabriskie Point, that are vastly superior to anything ever made in that period mm. by an American. Um, the only other film, American film, I think of their period, um, we're talking, uh, you know, commercial film, maybe maybe there were underground films made at that time, um, that uh, of which I'm unaware, but, I, but I'm, I'm speaking of a very specific type of film. That would be Medium Cool, the Haskell, Haskell Wexler film. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Which, which has something in common with uh, yes. uh, elements in common with uh, Zabriskie Point, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, but I but um, but uh, yeah, that's that's uh, that's how I see uh, uh, you know that's that's one thing I wanted to crowbar in there about uh, Zabriskie Point is that I no, I'm glad you did because I've I've been meaning to see both of those for so long. I mean, just in general, I've been meaning to see more uh, Agnes Varda films because I've only seen a couple, and the ones I saw. Uh, I really like, so I will check those out for sure. Uh, you, I know you're off and on on social media, but uh, <laughs> if you want to share your handles on Twitter, the Versia at the Versia, Versia, I you yeah. Know, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm on Twitter. I mean, I have an account, but I never <laughs> use it. Um, and uh, you know, I'm on Instagram, and I'm on you know Facebook. Uh, <laughs> But uh, but I, I love the but I, I that. Oh God, that place! <laughs> My God, that, it's just. I mean, uh, you know, that place. That place is uh, the internet for me. Is the is the internet, internet equivalent of a dystopia? You know, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's it's like that town is a risky point. You know. Um, except there are no young people there. Uh, Facebook <laughs> at this point is just yeah, all this old is man, all like young people at a counter, you know. <laughs> hey, here's my ideas about politics, <laughs> and here's some pictures of my kids and my grandkids. Um, and, that sounds like a surrealist film right there. Uh, here's my opinion about that new movie everybody out there is talking about. <laughs> I'm going to argue with you about blog. I like blonde. Well, I don't know about you. I'll fight with you about blonde. Right, that's my idea of Facebook. That's pretty accurate. <laughs> All right. Well, I will leave those links. <laughs> I don't know if you want to follow Duke after that, but you still hey, might. Well, I, you know, that's that's all right. You're not. I'm not going to put much up there anyway. <laughs> well, they'll um, be there uh, if you want. But again. Thanks so much again, Duke, for your time. Thank you for uh, having me, and thank you for doing this segment. I I love this film. It's it's I I, I really it like now it more as well. than ever after watching it. I, I yeah, I, it really holds up for me. I'm glad I I'm glad I got to it because I I like Antonio Antonioni a lot. I just haven't seen this one yet. So thanks so much, and let's do it again sometime I hope soon. So. I hope so. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching and or listening. If you are currently listening to this on the audio version of my YouTube channel and you've run out of episodes to listen to, head over to the YouTube channel where every single episode that I have ever recorded can be found. Please go to youtube.com slash Robert Bellissimo at the movies. I also want to thank all of my members on Patreon. If you're interested in becoming a, a member of my Patreon and receiving exclusive bonus content, Head over to the link for full details, patreon.com slash Robert Bellissimo at the movies. 
And lastly, if this is your first time here on my YouTube channel, please consider subscribing if you haven't already done so. By pressing the Robert Bellissimo at the Movies logo, you will see it floating above my head in the top left corner to your top left in just a second. Just click on that and then click the bell in order to get a notification every time I release one of my new episodes or when I go live. Thank you so much, everyone. I will see you in the next episode.